Want to keep fancy mollies? Might be a little harder than you bargained for. Keep watching as I share my top tips and tricks for keeping these things alive and breeding them. Hi, I'm Irene with Girl Talks Fish, and I only have two aquariums. One is my 20 gallon back to basics beginner planted tank. Yes, that's the name I decided on. And the other one is this 10 gallon breeding tank in my kitchen. In fact, I made a whole bucket list on all the breeding projects I want to do in this tank, which you can see right here. And balloon mollies just seem like a good place to start. I just have a special place in my heart for these fish because they are the first live bearer I ever kept, but I could never keep them alive. Like every time I got them, they would bring home Calmneris, which would kill not only themselves, but all the other fish I owned. Horrible experience, but definitely taught me the importance of quarantining new fish. But now that I'm a seasoned fish keeper, I gotta conquer this fish, right? So back in like December of last year, I went to Petco and they only had three Dalmatian balloon mollies, two males and one female. So I ended up taking a pair for breeding purposes. Now, ideally you want one male for every two to three females, just so that the males won't bother the girls so much. But I was hoping if I provided enough cover, they'd be okay. Now, Spotty is the groom dressed all in black, and you can tell he's male because he's got a thin, stick-like horizontal anal fin called a gonopodium, versus Dottie is the bride dressed all in white, and her anal fin is more of a fan shape. Now, they were the only two fish in this tank, so I fed them a lot to condition them for breeding. So, like most live bears, they're always hungry and will pretty much take anything you will give them, sinking or floating. So I gave them things like um, frozen foods, flakes and pellets, rapashi gel food, and they'll even eat the algae off the side of the walls. Now supposedly molly females have a gestational period of 60 days, which is rather long compared to most live bears. And Dottie looked like, at the time I got her, too young to be pregnant yet, so I was prepared to wait a while. Exactly one month after I got them, I came to the tank and suddenly noticed that Dottie was having swim bladder issues, like her head was pointed downwards, she couldn't upright herself, and then her tail and anal fin had exploded with this white cottony fungus or something. Now there are a lot of ways you can treat cottony growths. On one hand, it could be a bacterial infection like columnaris again, and in that case you might want to use an antibiotic like erythromycin or there's lots of other methods you could use. If it is actually fungus, things like methylene blue, um, IC-X has like formaldehyde and malachite green chloride in it, or good old aquarium salt. Now since mollies can survive in brackish and all the way up to salt water, I decided to try aquarium salt. In fact, I had recently written an article for Aquarium Co-op on how to treat sick fish with aquarium salt, and basically there's three levels of concentration. Level one is the weakest, it's almost like putting neosporin or a topical ointment on a wound. And she was definitely in trouble. So I went straight to level two, which is one tablespoon of aquarium salt for every two gallons of water. And I treated the whole tank because there was no aquarium plants in there to kill. And then I didn't know if the male had it, the problem too. Uh, by the next day, she was already looking much better. Like she still had swimming issues, like was swimming funny, but she was actually looking for food. And then by the time one week was over, she was, she looked great. Like all the funkos was gone and you could actually see her um, back fins starting to grow back. Unfortunately, by day nine, where I hadn't done any water changes yet, the fungus came back in full force. So I went ahead and took the opportunity to do a water change and then I had the concentration at level three, which is basically one tablespoon of aquarium salt for every one gallon of water. Really, really intense. In my research to find out what was going on, I finally ended up watching Aquarium Co-op's care video on mollies and whoops, I found out that a lot of these mollies are bred in overseas fish farms where freshwater is super expensive. So they end up mixing it with ocean water so that it's cheaper and then these brackish raised mollies are sold to you, come home to your fully freshwater setup and then they crash of course, especially if you have really soft water like I do. So uh, rather than just add aquarium salt to treat the fungus, I also got some sea chem equilibrium to raise the water hardness and add some more of those essential minerals like calcium and magnesium. I also installed a tank divider, which I bought from Life with Pets, um, just so that the male could be separated from the female and give her a little alone time to recover. Thankfully, Dottie made a full recovery and one month later, she gave birth.
Unfortunately, the holes in the tank divider were a little too big and the fry were able to travel between the two divisions. So I ended up removing the parents entirely so that, well, A, the parents wouldn't eat the fry, B, the fry wouldn't have to compete with the adults for food, and then C, some people say that keeping fry in a breeder box for too long can stunt their growth. So in this way, they would have the whole aquarium to themselves to explore. D, I wanted to raise the fry in full fresh water so their bodies wouldn't fail like their parents did. So I ended up doing a 50% water change every single day for a week to remove as much salt as possible and keep the water quality high. And it worked! As you can see, the fry all survived and are thriving in my super soft tap water. Now a seasoned female molly can give birth to more than 50 fry, but since I think this was Dottie's first pregnancy, there was only six. Um, yeah, the cool thing about live bears is unlike the fry for egg layers, live bears are so much stronger, bigger, hardier. So in the beginning, I fed them several times a day on a diet of things like um, baby brine shrimp, easy fry food, crushed up flakes, of course, and rapashi gel food. I also moved all the algae infested plants that came from the Shy Guys jungle tank into this tank so they had plenty to graze on all day. Because of all the live aquarium plants, the nitrate levels have always been pretty low despite all the feedings I do and I don't think I've ever seen it get above 20 ppm. So when they were babies, I would do like several 15% water changes several times a week and then now that they're older, it's about once a week water changes just like the main tank. So at birth, they were about like 0.75 centimeters, a little more than a quarter of an inch long. And then more than two months later, they're about an inch long or two and a half centimeters. Temperature definitely plays a huge role in their growth rate and metabolism. So for me, I keep this around 74 to 78 degrees Fahrenheit so that they won't grow, grow like too big too fast and then have a shorter lifespan. Within one to three months, they should be ready to sex and hopefully rehome so that I can get this tank ready for the next breeding project. If you're interested in cool breeding projects you can do in a 10 gallon tank, check out my list over here. And then a huge thanks to Kira for being the latest Patreon supporter. You're the best. Take time to enjoy your aquariums and I'll see you in the next video.